Hello YouTube, this is Marauders here again, and well, so far we've already installed Docker in our system, and I've shown how to create containers from your code. Now, as I mentioned before, containers are basically a new way to package and deploy your code. So we've already packaged and deployed our code, but of course, one way to expand our horizons is that we, we should see how other people are using containers. And of course, we should see how this method of packaging and deploying code benefits us as a developer and probably user of all the any of these uh, separate systems. Okay, so first of all, the first thing I we're going to try is that I'm going to show you this thing called Swagger Editor. Is that the right URL? Yep. Okay, so Swagger Editor is basically uh, an online hosted, uh, hosted online. Um, let me see. I remember the terms. This is either Open API 2.0 or Swagger Editor or Swagger 1.0 file format. Basically, it's a is a schema like is a schema file format for describing a. Uh, uh, HTTP API services and uh, it's pretty nice uh, very nice interface it's a very good tool that I use all the time but personally I don't like using tools where you know we are we might be typing in code for the for some client or, or something here and we accidentally click on one of these things that submits our code to the server backend I'm a bit uh, worried about doing things like that so the interesting thing here is if we go to the Docker Hub and we search for Swagger Editor and okay here we go Swagger API Editor okay so this is actually a containerized uh, version of this app so okay so if we pull it it will just be running locally on our machine which is great so now we just take a look at instructions so it's just a simple image where we just pull pull the image and just run it on port 80 on port uh on our port okay so you can see that the container exposes port 8080 and we can just publish it to whatever port we want Okay, let's give it a try. I'm going to start up Linux. We're going to go into our uh, user. So I'm just going to say copy this command and run it. Okay, so it is going to now go and download the image. Okay, so the image is now downloaded. Let's open a new in private window and we're gonna just browse to localhost. And boom, our a local copy of Swagger Editor has just been. We're just running Swagger Editor locally. And we didn't have to really set up any. We didn't have to really like go through the download and manually set up uh server or anything it, we just type the docker command to pull it to pull the image and uh we have it running and of course if i already had something running on port 80 and therefore i don't want it what i can do i don't want it running on port 80 i can just easily stop the container now please learn the docker cli commands the command line commands so docker ps will show us all the running containers so we have a name here nervous jenison so i can just say container stop nervous jenison okay so now i'm just gonna run it again at like some other port let's say 9030 Okay, 9030, and we'll just go here. 
and boom okay now this is all this is great and all but of course we don't want to keep this constantly running because we don't need it all the time so obviously we're gonna every time we're done with it we're gonna say docker container stop modus hoover and then when we run it again we're gonna have to like do docker run and type all this thing again hopefully you remember it but there is an easier way to do this so there is an easier way to do this and that's called using that's we're going to make use of something called docker compose okay so what is docker compose well the easiest way to summarize it is that it is a way of describing describing a uh, container applications using a file so you can like preset the the docker parameters and commands preset the containers that make up uh, an application and it's a very easy way to like start and stop certain uh, things over and over again very easily okay now instead of explaining some more let's just show you an example so what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna hit to our home user home directory in Linux okay do this in the Linux uh, partition don't do it in the Windows partition and I'm just going to make a simple directory called stacks because we're going to start putting our things here. Okay, so I'm going to say we're going to make a stack called Swagger Editor. So you must do this in your own folder because of how certain things are going to work. So now that I'm in this folder, I'm going to create a file called docker compose.yaml and I could do the unique thing which is I could say touch the file and then I can either use nano or I can use vi to edit the file okay but because we are using Windows subsystem for Linux I'm gonna use something that I prefer which is I'm just gonna run Visual Studio Code on this folder okay so notice this is now running Visual Studio Code on the folder okay so we, we are directly editing the file in the Linux partition using our Windows version of Visual Studio Code this is really cool if you haven't already if you don't already feel that yet okay so here we have our swagger file our our docker compose file and it's a yaml file so in case if you're not familiar with it yaml is just another type of file format like xml and json and whatnot okay so the basics of uh of a yaml file is that it is cons it's a file that consists of key value pairs so here the file format requires me to have a version on top so we're going to say version 3.8 and then we're going to describe our services and then the second specialty of a yaml file is that it is an indention aware it's one of those file formats that indention is important so if I have a hierarchy and I need something under services and I'm going to de define an object underneath it, I need to press tab to indent it out. And we're going to call this service Swagger Editor. Okay, so inside Swagger Editor, we have some other properties, which is like we need to use the, the container, the image that we want. So remember just now we pulled Swagger api slash swagger editor swagger editor and of course we want to map our ports so please do read up on the formatting of this file and the file reference from the docker compose website 
Okay, save. So you can see that this is all pretty basic. It's basically just what we did with our docker run command just now. We ran the image, swagger api slash editor, and we exposed the port, our local port 9080 to port 8080. Okay, so now how do we run this? To run this, we're going to come into our, uh, in our folder, or you know what, I'll just do it inside Visual Studio Code. I'm going to say new terminal. So notice how I open the terminal into the WSL folder. So I'm just going to type WSL to enter Linux. And I'm going to say docker compose up dash D. And once again, it's going to go and start up the containers. And now when I look at our containers, you can see that I have this running. So it's a more of a special icon to indicate that it's running via Docker Compose, but I can eat, but it's just up here. Okay. So now when I run a new window, so we put it at 9030. Do we put 9030 or 9080? I put it at 9080. Okay, I'm mistake. 9080. And there we go, it's running. And Let's say if I'm done with it, I can just come back to the same folder and I can say docker compose down. And you see that the resources are immediately thrown away. And then when I need to use it, I can say up again. And it will be recreated. But personally, if you know that is something that you want to bring up and down, then instead of saying down, you can say stop. So stop will just stop the containers but keep the thing here. So you can actually come back to the folder and say docker compose start to start it. Or we can just use the GUI and it will always be here and we can just start. Okay, so that's how we will run Swagger Editor as a container. So now it's as if we installed a Swagger Editor application. So we can start it when we need it. And when we are done, when we, are, we don't need it anymore, we can just stop it. It's just like an application on its own. Now let's look at something else as well. Now let's talk about another application that I use in my development, another component, which is RabbitMQ. Now, RabbitMQ is basically a message queue system. Yes, you can just, inst it's pretty easy to install in Windows. You just download the RabbitMQ, download the extremely large Erlang plugin, and you can get it up and running in your system. But the thing is, now that we are using containers, I can e deploy this as a container and then I can only I can make it so that I only run it when I need it and it's not there eating my system resources. So, okay, so here this is RabbitMQ. Once again, we're going to go to Docker where there's a repository of images and we're going to look for RabbitMQ and it so happens that there is an official image packaged by RabbitMQ. And so here, this is, this is the default instructions that we can use to pull the image. But remember that RabbitMQ has a management panel. So if we just pull this, it's just going to run the RabbitMQ service. And we're going to need some way of maintaining it. So Let's do some quick reading on the on this Docker Hub page about the image. Now, a tag is basically how you name and version your container images. So you can see this is a list of the tags. And what we want to look for here in this case is this one. 
so here it says this is how to run run Revit MQ with the management plugin installed and enabled by default in the on this port okay so let's go we're now going to try and implement this and uh, consume this in our system okay so we just take a look at the instructions management plugin mm-hmm mm -hmm. then we will take a look at so these are the environment variables and this is just a list of the user we need to know what how we can configure rabbit mq so you can see here okay this is just based on these variables how you're going to configure the rabbit mq let's look at the important things okay which is like we want to know how to implement the username and password so you see default user pass default username okay so this is just the default username and password okay so once we know how to configure it and we have the additional we have the tagged image that we want let's go ahead and start making our docker compose file again so i'm going to mkdir rabbit mq okay so we're gonna run code here let's make a new file docker compose.yaml oops okay now one more thing that we need to be aware of is that rabbit mq you remember that containers a containers file system is very temporary so if it if the container gets destroyed whatever files that you're saving to it will be destroyed as well so it will just be it will just be gone okay so if you want to persist the files inside your containers you want to write it into a particular folder you want to put it into a, an actual folder itself a folder in your own directory so if we see here again this is different from, from every image so you have to figure it out based on what people are saying so we can see that this rabbit mq is writing into this folder inside the container so what we're gonna do is we're gonna map this container this folder into another our actual folder let me just start working on it so version 3.8 services we're gonna start a rabbit mq service we're gonna use that management interface that came out the one with the management ui plugged in so as i mentioned they said rabbit rabbit mq colon three dash management okay cool and then we're going to set some environment variables environment variables which is rabbit mq default username we're gonna say mq user rabbit mq default pass 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 ah mq pass okay ports so the default rabbit mq port is going to be 5672 and the default management port is 15672 so we just plug this in or i could just say the web or the web port should be 9031 for the ui so now we're gonna bind our 
that port that uh, data folder that we mentioned so so we're going to say that given a source which is where this docker compose file is the imq data we're going to bind it to the varlib rabbit mq folder of the container okay so save the file and we're gonna bring up the terminal again docker compose up dash detach so now it's gonna go pull the container and start it up Okay, so now the RabbitMQ container has started and uh, let's go check it out. So I'm going to open a new browser window. So remember, we tied the management port to 9031. Okay, so RabbitMQ. And there we go. We are... We have a Rabbit MQ instance already, just by downloading it from a container. And I can assure you, given my experience of installing Rabbit MQ through Windows to get the, uh, especially the Erlang download runtime, this is much faster than downloading the Erlang runtime. I don't know why the website is just very slow for downloading Erlang. So, okay, we have a Rabbit MQ. We can just use it exactly like how we are using any other normal rabbit mq instance so once again we've been able to very quickly and easily deploy something uh, a development component without worrying about dependencies and and other issues like okay what if i don't need it i need instead of having to go into windows services and turn it off i can just stop it here it's a nice, very fast and easy way of stopping and turning stuff on and off. Okay, so now it's off. Okay, but let's move on because no, most people don't use uh, RabbitMQ. What we want now is let's try and run a database. And finally, let's talk about databases. So of course, one of the databases that I've been using recently is basically Postgres. Post, how do you post Postgres SQL? Okay, so we go to Hog, Docker Hub. We search for Postgres, and okay, there's a official image for Postgres SQL. Then it says this is how this is the, the image name is basically Postgres, but of course we can look at the tags to see. For database, of course, we need to be a bit more careful. We want the the version of the database that we are actually using. So sometimes you need to be aware and just look at the tags to see which one are you which one are what are what's available. So we have like 14.1. 14 and so on okay 
So we just need to be mindful about which is the version of the database that we want to use. So the easiest thing here is that there's just a major version. So we can just pull Postgres and say 14.1 or something. So let's just do that. Again, look at the instructions. They'll tell you what to do. To how you're going to use it. What's the available things to use. Okay. Ugh, okay, try nearly try to sneeze it. <clears throat> so we're just gonna go for the, this common form for the Postgres DB, but of course this is a database. Remember, a database we need to as I mentioned, don't write the files into the container. We need the files to be persistent so that if the container dies, our databases are still there. So let's see how to configure the user. Okay. And here we go. PG data. So this mentions what is the directory for the database file. So okay, this is what we're looking for. We need to know where it's saving the database files so we know what path to map it to. Okay, so we can see here that the path in the container is going to be slash var lib postgres data. Postgres data pg data, okay? So we're going to just remember that and we are going to bind it to our own data. Okay. So let's go build our postgres compose file now. Okay. Let's say pg uh, code dot so we're gonna say compose dot yaml version three point eight version three point eight services we're gonna say uh, we have a pgdb image postgres let's use version i guess there's a version 14 right we'll we saw 14 14.1 um okay we'll use 14.1 let's use the latest 14.1 environment because we need to set up the user password for the postgres user so pass, 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 one, two, three, four. Okay, an interesting thing to note here is that is that when you are entering values for these uh for these uh tags, remember that you are now doing this in in a Linux shell form. So one thing that we might have been like uh you may you might be inclined to use is like this password but the problem is dollar is actually a escape symbol in the in the shell so i think and i'm not very good with my escape character so try and do some reading on the linux side if you want to use all these special characters in the values so I'm not, so I'm just going to say pass, pass, one, two, three, four. We're going to say our PG data folder in the container is going to be this. And of course, we will ask it to expose the 5432 as 5432 as if it's an actual Postgres in our local machine. And we are going to bind our PG data folder. We're going to have a nice little pg data folder in our container here and we will bind it to the postgres data which which we defined up there postgres sql data so so this and this should match okay so there we go this is our database and uh well let's let's bring it up docker compose up dash d 
Uh, services PGDB. Oh, okay. Let's spell image correct incorrectly. Okay, let's go. Docker compose up dash D. Okay, so it's gonna pull the Postgres DB image and we'll see what happens. Okay, yes. We have our database running. So, what can we do now? I mean, I have no idea. Because we have a database running, but we don't have any administrating administrative tools to connect to it yet. Of course, I think... Uh, one thing you can do is that in the as i mentioned that containers are actually just like another session that you're running so you can actually click on the container and what you can do here is that we see this command here this will this will open up a shell session into our our container so now we are actually inside the main container itself and if I knew how to use Linux properly, I could probably issue a psql command. Oh look, there is a psql command. Okay, so we are actually running this inside the container, you can see. But really, this is something that I don't know how to use. So let's go find an, a Postgres admin tool. So what is the Postgres admin tool that we're going to install? Well, it's called PG Admin. Okay, so this is a web-based Postgres administrative tool. And the interesting thing here is that they already have a officially supported container deployment, which is going to be great. Okay, let's look at the instructions on Docker Hub for running this container. Okay, so here are the here's the image and. The Docker Hub sends us back to PG Admin for instructions on running the container. Seriously, why didn't you just link this back to here? I don't know. Okay, I really don't know. Okay, so let's take a look. It's talking about how to actually use this. So first they say this is the deployment. Okay, the deployment is this image. We're going to look at how to configure certain things. These are the variables that we'll need to log in. So this is a username and password, some other information. Anything for the default verification. Okay. So these are the directories that will allow it to save the the data information. And one thing we that says that they they did have some warning that says okay remember you need to give permission to this where you have this you need to run this security setting to change the user ID group. So we need to these are things that we need to be aware of. Okay, so they said that this is the folder where it stores the information and configuration. So this is the this is the container directory which we'll need to save. And then of course we also need to give it this this information. This this uh user permissions. Okay, these are okay, these are the things we, we don't really need. Okay, so now we've identified what did we do? We've identified the image. We identified some of the environment variables that we need. We need to set the default username and password to log in. We identified where the what is the folder that needs to to save the information to, and any some special things that we need to run before we can get this to work properly. Okay, let's set up pg admin so we're back in our stacks folder so first i'm going to make a directory to put our pg admin stuff in 
and we're gonna make a folder to store the store this uh, data file so we're gonna say we're gonna make a pg admin folder and remember they said we need to give it this permission so okay we're just gonna say sudo chon sudo chon so if you're unaware about your linux commands chon is basically change permissions on the file so we're giving the permission to 50 50 for this uh pg admin folder i hope you remembered your password for your sysadmin because that's what sudo does it elevates it into the sysadmin okay so now we have a pg admin folder in here okay that's great let's create the compose file Okay, services pg admin image image what was the image image is d page slash pg admin four environment pg admin default email so we're gonna just say user at user.com uh one thing to remember about the yaml files is that it's very important to know where all the, about the spaces and the tabs for example this is wrong because there's no space between the key and the and the value so just remember that And of course, the port is going to port 80 in the container, so we'll just map our uh, our uh, localhost 9432 into port 80. And we are going to bind our PG admin folder that we created just now into the pg admin folder here <clears throat> which is what was mentioned here this is where the full information will be stored okay so we're going to save this and then we will bring up the container docker compose up oh i forgot to detach <clears throat> You need to be, define the admin email and default password. Did I, did I not define it? Let's see. EG admin default email password. Password. Okay. Dash D. Okay. So yeah, I tested it before. So that's why I didn't really need to download all the images. Okay so let's run remember that we have basically if we look at our containers our running containers we have our pg admin running and it's running at port 9432 okay let's go http localhost 9432 okay user user.com pass pass one two three four and okay we have our pg admin loader now let's connect to our database now remember that we exposed our database on port 5432 so that shouldn't be a problem we will say connect to a server our db server um localhost 5432 postgres pass pass 1234 save 
Okay, now it seems like we have a problem. It's unable to connect to localhost one two three four blah 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 blah. Okay, so why did this happen? That's because if you remember from when we were talking about building our containers, each container is actually in its own network subgroup. So the Postgres container, the database container, is actually here in this network and it exposed out 5432 and the pg admin is actually in this network so when you try to say localhost 5432 what happens is that the pg admin container is just looking at itself which obviously there's no 5432 port right now running in this container so what we want to do is we need the pg container to access the 5432 from our local in our actual host system and this is a question that actually gets asked all the time when using with containers how do i hit my host network from my look from a container and actually the answer is very simple the domain name has already been predefined it is host.docker.internal to reach your main internal server your your host machine. So host.docker.internal, boom, and there we go. Here is our database. Okay, so I'm gonna just create a database. Our DB. Okay, that's our server, not our DB. <laughs> that's our server, not our DB. Okay, so here. I created a database, I'll just create, I can just go ahead and manage it by creating new things like uh, my table. No, I'm not supposed to create a schema, I'm supposed to create a table, yes. So let's say I'm going to create a table, my table. My table. I'm going to make some data, users, text. Yes, primary key, yes. Okay, so I, I managed and I created everything already. So there we go, there we have it. I, I've i deployed a database and I deployed the administrative tool completely using containers and I can now access it using code. Because again, if I have code running in my local machine, I can just local machine 5432 to hit the PG port. And if I have code running in the containers, I can just route it through back to the host, host port to, to hit back into the database itself. But let's take a look at this for a second. If I have my database running, of course I will have my admin tool running. So instead of running both of them separately, you, you could pretty much say that the database and the administrative tool is related to each other. So why don't I just make them run together? Okay, so here's what we're going to do now. Remember that when I first mentioned about the Docker Compose file, I mentioned that it is a way to define that you can have multiple containers that make up a particular set of, a, of an application or a deployment. So what you should look at it is that you could sort of look at a Docker Compose file as defining a physical hardware rack where you're going to put machines and each of your machines are actually a container itself. So let's say right now we have these two separate machines here. One is running PG admin and one is running the database. So I'm going to just stop these right now. And of course we'll just take away this PG admin service for now because I, I, we're going to move this together. And here we have our, here this is our compose for our Postgres, I'm going to take our PG admin service and I'm going to just put it here into the 
Docker composed of the, our database of our previously our database uh, database Docker compose. So what happens now is that what I'm saying is that this deploy this deployment actually has two services now PG the database and the admin service. Okay, okay. So first of all is that we still need to recreate this PG admin folder in this PG uh under this uh PG folder. So I'm gonna go to my PG folder. We can see that there was already a PG data created for holding the Postgres data. And if you want to look into the contents, oh, it's denied because what happens was that it is actually owned by root. So let's say if we want to go into this folder and take a look at it, just remember, don't simply touch it. I can say sudo s to create a session to elevate a root session and now I can actually look at the files okay I have no idea what these mean I, I'm not even sure where my databases are but basically if you need to look into these folders just that's basically how you do it <laughs> don't ask me what if what uh, either of these things are for Okay, we're going to come back out from there. Now, what were we doing? I was going to make the PG admin folder. And once again, we need to give the permissions to 5050 because that was what they mentioned just now, PG admin. Okay, so UID 5050. Okay, we have our new compose file now. So remember, we now have our database and our admin running together. So I'm going to say docker compose and to bring up this service. Oh, first of all, this service is already here. So what we want to do is we want to delete this old one because this one only had the database defined. I could either delete it here or remember Please learn the command line of the docker commands because again, it's Linux based. You are pretty much expected to know how to use a CLI. So I'm going to say docker compose down to bring down everything. So you can see it's deleted now. So once again, I'm going to bring this up with our new deployment. Okay, so now we see that the PG stack is up again. But interestingly now, we have both our containers are running inside this thing. And of course, I can, as just like normal, I can just go in. And we say user at user.com plus plus one, two, three, four. Okay, we came back to our PG admin, so I'm going to register the server again. Once again, I'm going to say host.docker.internal to reach the host. And of course, we can now see our database along with what we created just now. Okay, so that's great and all, but, but remember, something has changed. Now, our PG admin and our database is actually inside the same stack. So pre while previously, we our situation was like this, where the PG admin and the database were in a different stack, a different network. What happens now is that this has happened. This is now the case. So we, instead of having our PG admin connect to the local host, we can actually redirect it back to the actual database port inside the inside this container, this stacks network already. 
So how do we go about doing that? How do we refer to this container when it's inside this stack? Again, it's a very, very simple process. All we have to do is look back at our Docker Compose file. Notice that when we named our service, we named it PGDB. So if I come in here, I'm going to remove this, this server. I'm going to say connect to a server. So we can call it container db server connection. And the host address is going to be the name that we gave our service, which is pgdb. And look, we've connected to it by directly going into the containers network instead of coming out through the local host. And that is how you can make a self-contained deployment of a service. Because now, basically, we are not routing to the local host already. We are just going directly through, directly through the network itself, through the container network itself. And that's basically how I set up my my development system right now my postgres is actually all just running uh running through the containers and i just start and stop these whenever i need to and then it's like you know when you need the some extra memory to run a game or something you don't need to fuss everywhere you just need to turn it off and everything just turns off and you get you get the additional resources back from your system so in summary, what, what I've demonstrated in this video is the fact that containers are a very great way of deploying applications. And as a developer, it's a very good way for you to consume and like utilize other, other applications that have been deployed as containers. So you can easily deploy, deploy additional systems and uh, resources into your, your machine without really worrying about dependencies or other things, which is basically what containers are. There are still a lot of things that I haven't touched on, which is things like the more intricate things about the network and uh, volume bindings. And that's all things that you really should take a look at for on your own, because uh, the, the actual full topic of how containers work is going to be very, very vast. Okay, so uh, that's it. See you all in the next video.